looks like we have some people tuning in right now. We're going to wait just a couple of minutes until everybody joins us before we get started. Um, but welcome very much to Spooky Science on a Sphere. Um, we're very excited today to bring you this live Halloween program. Um, I'm Nick Van Acker. I'm one of the educators here at Michigan State University Museum here in the Science on a Sphere Gallery. Um, we have a lot of great stuff we're going to be talking about today, um, but we also have just a couple of housekeeping things and some introductions to do before we get started. So a lot of people are kind of filtering in. Um, if you guys want to start leaving in the chat, you can leave your names, maybe um, what sort of costume you're using for Halloween, what your favorite Halloween candy is, um, any sort of Halloween-themed things in the chat would be awesome, just so we can kind of get to know you guys. Um, but so, like I said, my name is Nick Van Acker. Uh, we've got a couple of other people joining us here today, um, one of which is Alina Bowman. Um, Alina Bowman is one of our Science on the Sphere presenters, and she is going to be acting as a moderator today. So if you guys have any questions or comments that you want to leave in either the chat or the Q&A box throughout the program, you can feel free to leave those there. Alina will be reading through them and relaying them to me. Um, and then if you uh, will also be tossing out some things to the audience. So if you guys have answers to questions, um, you can leave those there as well. I'll be able to be keeping an eye on them and letting us know. But of course, it's not just the MSU Museum team today. We are also joined by our special guest from the Michigan State University Bug House. So we have Gary Parsons and Amanda Lorenz. Um, and they are going to be showing us some great creepy crawlies, some Halloween creepy crawlies um, at their location in the second half of the program. So stay tuned for some really, really cool Halloween bug facts and also to see some live creepy crawlies um, from the MSU Bug House. Um, and then just last thing uh, to keep in mind, you'll notice right now I am not wearing a mask. The reason for that is because I'm in a closed off room. Um, so we're following all of MSU's guidelines, um, but without wearing a mask, you can hear me and see me a lot better. Um, so that's why we're doing that. But don't worry, I do have it in my pocket. Nobody's coming in the room though, so we will be fine. So we can get started talking about stuff. Um, this is the live Halloween Science on a Sphere show, like I said. Um, and so we have all sorts of cool things to talk about today. During my portion of the program, we're going to be talking about some cool, the science of cool Halloween monsters. Uh, we're going to be talking about slime that's able to think for itself. And we're also going to talk about animals that glow in the dark. So lots of cool, fun things. And so we can get started just by talking about some of the Halloween monsters. Um, so one of the things that I always think about when we talk about Halloween monsters are skeletons, right? So we see skeletons all over the place around Halloween time. Uh, they're just constantly hanging from people's porches and in people's yards and all sorts of fun things. But skeletons aren't just around to be spooky, right? Um, skeletons are actually serve a really important purpose to animals and to humans. Um, skeletons act as our support structure. Um, without a skeleton inside of us, we would just be a big blob of skin and muscle, right? Um, so skeletons are really important to help us keep our shape. Um, we can also learn a lot from skeletons. So we actually have a bunch of different skeletons in the museum. Um, if you've been to the museum before, you'll know that we have big dinosaur skeletons, we have a couple of huge elephant skeletons. Um, so we have lots of skeletons on display, but we also have skeletons from our collections. So this squirrel skeleton I have right here actually came from our research collections. Um, we have a bunch of things like this behind the scenes that researchers use to help learn more about science. And skeletons are really useful for helping us learn things. So we can learn all about maybe, uh, if we look at a skeleton's teeth in their skull, we can learn about what an animal might have eaten. If we look at their bones, we can see maybe where muscles attach. We can learn how skeletons move around, how the animals move around. Um, whether they would walk or run or jump or swim. And we can also learn actually some really cool things about an animal's environment by looking at the chemical makeup of the bones, which we're actually going to talk about a little bit later. So skeletons are super cool and super important. They're a little bit creepy, but they're mostly really cool. Um, another Halloween monster that I always like to think about are vampires. And we've got a couple of cool things here about vampires. Uh, my vampire picture. So you can see we've got a vampire right there, very spooky, very creepy. Of course, vampires don't really exist in real life, right? Vampires aren't just walking around every day. But there are some organisms that do actually drink blood in the animal kingdom. We're going to talk about a couple of those in just a little bit. 
But first, I'm curious if you guys can tell me um, what sort of animals do you think in the animal kingdom drink blood? You can leave those in the chat. Uh, there's a whole bunch of them. I'm sure you guys have probably seen some of them before. Um, experience them maybe in the summer. Um, so I'm curious, and Alina will keep an eye on that chat and let me know in a couple of minutes what sorts of animals drink blood. Um, but while we're talking about that, we might wonder, why would an animal want to drink blood in the first place, right? Blood's kind of gross, right? It's kind of creepy, it goes inside of all of our veins. Um, why on earth would an animal want to drink that stuff? And the reason is because of the way that blood works. So I pulled up a blood data set here on the sphere for us, and you can see all of the different bits of the blood floating around, right? All the different cells. So we have our red blood cells that are kind of big, uh, big uh, flat plates that serve to move oxygen around our body. We've got the white blood cells that are kind of big spheres that help us fight diseases. Um, but blood is really important for moving things around, right? So it's important for moving oxygen around our body, but it's also really important for moving all sorts of nutrients and liquid around our body. So blood is basically just like kind of a protein shape moving things around our body, right? So when we want to get things into our blood, we have to eat them, we have to breathe them in. If I want to raise my blood sugar, I have to eat a piece of candy. If I want to get some protein into my body, I have to eat a hamburger. But so some animals have figured out that, hey, that's a whole lot of work. I don't want to have to do that. So they've decided to just drink blood directly to get all those nutrients directly into their body. Um, Lena, do we have some answers to some of the animals that might drink blood? Yeah, we have mosquitoes, bats, ticks, bed bugs, and leeches. Perfect. Those are all animals that I have as well. Um, so I'm going to pull up some pictures with some of those animals, and we'll share some of the cool facts about those animals with you guys today. So the first thing that you said, or one of the things you said, was bed bugs, right? So bed bugs are a really common bug that we know are very really common arachnid, as we know, that drinks blood, right? Um, bed bugs exist all over the world. They're actually, it's a big problem with bed bugs now. They're spreading all over the place, but we know that they'll sometimes bite people and drink their blood. Um, we've also got fleas, which I don't think you said um, in Alina in the chat, but they're similar to bed bugs, right? They're another type of animal that's going to drink blood. We have mosquitoes, and then we have ticks. Um, all of these are arachnids or insects that drink blood, and they all do it for similar reasons, right? So we talked about that blood is really good at pumping all these nutrients around your body. So these animals would drink blood to just get a quick meal. Um, usually when they're drinking blood, they're going to do that so they can go lay eggs later. Um, there's nothing wrong with that necessarily. They're just trying to make a living. They're just trying to get food whatever way they can. But of course, the problem is when an animal or an insect drinks blood, sometimes it can spread disease. So we know that with mosquitoes, we know that with ticks. Um, so of course we have to be careful about these blood drinking animals, right? Um, I have a bunch of specimens here on the table in front of me. One of the specimens that I have are some ticks. So I'm going to bring that up close to the camera so you guys can see. Um, and these are two ticks that are from Michigan. Um, they're actually the same species. But you can see they look really different, right? So there's one that's kind of small and brown, and there's another one that's really big and fat, kind of yellowy white. Um, so like I said, these two are the same type of tick. The difference is the small brown one hasn't drank any blood, and the big fat white one has drank blood. Um, and so you can see that on the sphere as well. There's a picture that's got two ticks in it. One is small, one's really big and fat. Um, and so that's what happens to a tick after it's drank some blood. Um, so if you ever do find a tick on you, it's helpful to know. If you see just, just kind of small and flat, it probably means that it hasn't drank your blood yet. You'll still want to get it checked out. But if it's big and white, it means that it probably has drank blood recently. So it's kind of an interesting, fun thing about uh, some invertebrates that drink blood. Um, Alina, you said also that someone had said leeches, right? Yes. Yes. So leeches are another animal that's going to drink blood, kind of the vampires of the animal world. Um, leeches are really crazy. Um, and leeches actually relate to what I'm dressed up as today. Um, so you might be looking at me and kind of wondering what my costume is. I'm dressed up as a duck that's also dressed up as a doctor. So I'm dressed up as quack medicine. Um, quack medicine is another term for fake medicine, basically. It's medicine that doesn't have any basis in science. Somebody just decided, hey, that thing might work to cure somebody. 
um, but it didn't have any sort of testing or any sort of scientific basis to it. Um, and leeches used to be a type of quack medicine. So a long, long time ago, people thought that the body could have what was called an imbalance of humors. Um, so basically an imbalance of bodily fluids, that maybe you could have too little blood or too much blood. You could have too little bile or too much bile. Um, of course, we do know that you can have too little of a lot of bodily fluids, and that's a problem. But having too much isn't really a thing. But the doctors, with big air quotes of the time, thought that you could get rid of people's blood by putting leeches on them, and that might help cure them. Now, that's a pretty ridiculous thing, right? We know that that's not actually going to help someone you know, uh, come back from a disease. But people are still using leeches nowadays in medicine. They're just using them a little bit different. It turns out that when you put a leech on somebody, it actually can bring more blood to an area. So maybe if you have uh, a certain issue where you aren't getting enough blood flow after surgery, or if you have you know, just any sort of issue like that, doctors will sometimes use leeches to help kind of stimulate the blood flow of that area. It's not used very often, and it's kind of a controversial procedure, um, but of course those leeches are taken very good care of to make sure that they don't spread diseases between people. Um, another weird thing about leeches, um, you might be able to tell in this picture, I don't know how long you've looked at a picture of a leech before, but leeches are actually a type of worm. So they're related to things like earthworms. Um, they're just like blood dripping earthworms, which is really crazy and kind of creepy. Um, you're not going to come across leeches that often in the wild. They're actually somewhat endangered, some species of them. Um, and of course, even if you do come across a leech, not all of them drink blood, only a couple species do. So leeches are just a really cool animal that you don't have to be as scared of. Um, something else, Alina, that you said that the, the people left in the chat were bats. So I'm curious if you guys want to leave uh, an answer in the chat here as well. Do you think that all bats drink blood, or do you think that only certain bats drink blood? And I'm curious to see the answer to that in the chat, so it'll depend what we talk about. Alina, what are you pause. Um, we're having a bit of People can't see you. They can only see the bats. They don't have an option to change the view to like, oh, you. So just yes. to let you know. That is great. Yeah, so um, what you guys might be able to do is if you go to your uh, view section, you might see a button that says gallery view. Um, so you can you can hit that and then you'll be able to see both me and the bats. Um, they apparently also, don't have that option. So. Okay, well, that's yeah. totally all right. Um, yeah. Yeah, that, that's totally fine. Um, so okay. we can figure that out. Were they able to see, were you guys able to see the tips that I showed you? Or was that uh, not on screen as well? A couple people were not able to. Okay, um, so we can figure that out. I will work on that. That's all right. Okay. Um, cool. then, no oh, some people saw the ticks. They saw the ticks on the sphere. Um, and then the answer to your question, people are saying only certain bats drink blood. Yes, that is exactly the right answer. Yes, so only certain types of bats drink blood, like the bat that we have on the sphere here. Um, so these bats are called vampire bats. Um, they're one of the most common types of bats you think about around Halloween because they're called vampire bats. Um, of course, vampire bats can't actually turn into a vampire, right? Um, and vampire bats do drink blood, but they're not in Michigan. We're not going to come across any sort of vampire bat in Michigan or any sort of blood drinking bat in Michigan. Um, they only exist around the equator and I believe just in South America, South and Central America. Um, I think vampire bats are really cute. Um, they have really, really sharp teeth just on the front there, which uh, when they open up their mouths kind of makes them look like they have buck teeth, um, which I think is pretty cute and funny. Um, and they're also just funny, the, they'll walk around on the ground instead of flying. They will fly, but when they're trying to get a quick meal, they'll walk up to an animal and then scrape its leg with their sharp teeth to get a little bit of blood. Um, so if you ever see a video of vampire bats, I think they're pretty funny. Um, they're pretty cool. And so the last uh, type of blood drinking animals that we'll talk about um, are actually birds. So there's two different types of birds that will drink blood. There are yellow-billed oxpeckers, and there are vampire finches. Um, so I'll pull up the oxpeckers first. Um, oxpeckers are really cool. Um, you've probably seen these birds if you've watched something like The Lion King before. Um, so these birds are the ones that will hang out on the back of elephants and rhinos and zebras and eat all the little bugs off their back. Um, these oxpeckers, though, sometimes will get a little bit more creepy. 
Um, usually it's a nice beneficial relationship, it's called, between the bird and the bigger animal. So the bird gets a quick meal by eating all the insects off the bigger animal's back, and the bigger animal gets all the bugs off of it. Um, but sometimes in Africa, there's something called the dry season, right, where there's not as much rainfall that uh, usually comes to the area, and that makes animals a little bit desperate. So sometimes these ox peckers will get a little bit crazy and they'll peck at the animals a little bit too much until they start to bleed, and then they'll drink blood so they can get a quick meal, which is a little creepy. Um, but not quite as creepy as vampire finches. Um, vampire finches are native to the Galapagos, um, and vampire finches are basically like the ox peckers, where they will drink blood, but they don't drink blood from big animals like elephants or rhinos. They actually drink blood from other birds. So if there is an animal like that's most like a vampire in the world, it's probably a vampire finch because they're after drinking blood from other birds, which is pretty crazy. Um, so yeah, so we've got the vampires of the natural world, which are pretty interesting. Um, one thing that um, we can talk about, another kind of creepy Halloween monster that I mentioned at the beginning, is slime that's able to think for itself. Um, so I'm going to pull up another picture here that we can look at. And this is something that's called slime mold. Have you guys heard of slime mold before? Uh, you can leave yes or no in the chat. But slime molds are super, super cool. Um, you might have heard uh, about slime molds before in a couple of different studies that I'm going to talk about. Um, but so slime molds, despite the name, aren't actually a type of mold or fungus. They're a type of single cell organism. And so you can see they've got all this kind of like weird tendrils and stuff. It doesn't look like a normal bacteria would. But slime molds are crazy. They're a single cell organism. They can be up to a meter long. Um, and they can actually think and learn, even though they don't have nerves or a brain. So scientists have been able to study slime molds and teach them all sorts of things about uh, whether or not to like certain substances, like a slime mold might uh, learn to really like salt, or a slime mold might learn to hate salt. Um, and not only can a slime mold learn those things without a brain, it can also teach it to other slime molds. So one slime mold can connect up to another slime mold that's never had salt before, and the slime mold that has been around salt can send a message to the new slime mold that says, yeah, that's really, really good. Salt's really awesome. Or it can say, salt's really terrible. And then that new slime mold that's never experienced salt before in its life is able to experience salt and immediately know, yes, that's good, or no, that's bad. Um, so slime molds are really crazy, and scientists are studying them for all sorts of different things to learn about how organisms learn and think. Um, Slime molds are also being studied for a bunch of cool stuff because they are really smart. Um, so scientists are actually using them to uh, make maps better. So this is uh, an example of a study that was done a little while ago where scientists created a map of the United States and put down little drops of food all over the United States in the locations of major cities. Um, and then they put a slime mold on the plate to uh, show the, uh, how the slime mold could get from place to place. And the slime mold created a perfect map of the United States uh, that's almost perfect to show all of our highways that, you know, a whole group of humans had to come together to come up with. This one slime mold was able to figure out by itself. Um, and so scientists looking at that were actually able to create what's called a computer algorithm, which is basically teaching a computer how to think, um, and using the slime mold to create a different type of map. Um, and this is a computer-generated map of the United States, looking at all kind of the paths that the slime mold would take. Um, so, of course, we're not going to base our road system off of this map necessarily. It's pretty cool, but we're not going to completely change everything all over the place. But we can use this program for all sorts of different stuff. So, for instance, NASA actually used this computer algorithm pretty recently to map the areas between galaxies in the universe. Um, so slime mold was able to get us from just growing on a tiny plant on the ground all the way up to mapping the universe, which is really, really cool. Um, so slime molds are something pretty crazy, pretty creepy. So um, the last thing that we're going to talk about is going to be uh, animals that are actually able to glow in the dark. And so for this one, I'm going to try and switch my camera around, so hopefully we should be able to see things a little bit better. Um, I am going to turn off this camera that's looking at the sphere, and then I'll turn on the other camera. So we should see. All right, are people able to see myself right now down here? Dressed up as a duck. Okay. 
We yeah. have some yeses and yes. some noes. Okay, perfect. So if you can see me dressed up as a duck, that's awesome. Um, if not, you might be able to switch um, things around. Oh, okay, you see a picture of me looking, looking at, looking at the sphere. sphere. Okay. So I think so I'm going to. You and the audio is on the, the sphere cam. Yes, that makes sense. Okay, yeah. so I'm going to turn off my audio just for a second. Don't worry. Okay, can you all see me now? Yes, yes they can. Perfect, cool. So hopefully you guys have been able to see me through part of this program. If not, this has been my Halloween setup here. So we have all sorts of cool specimens here I can kind of go through. This is a skeleton that I was talking about from our museum collections. Um, we have a couple of other skeletons here that we might uh, look at a little bit later um, after uh, the Buckhouse does their presentation talk about kind of the, the difference between uh, internal skeletons and exoskeletons. And then of course I have my ticks that I was showing earlier um, right here. So you can see kind of, they're pretty small, not necessarily gonna be able to see them on yourself. But so yeah, so those are the specimens that I had uh, for the program that's open. But we do have some other cool specimens that we're gonna look at right now. So I said we're gonna be looking at glowing animals, right? So I have a couple of different uh, objects here that at first glance don't seem very similar. So we have a squirrel skeleton here. This is actually also from our research collections upstairs. Um, and that is a uh, fox squirrel skeleton. So those are squirrels you see in Michigan. We also have a piece of coral right here. And then I have a rock. Looks pretty normal, just kind of a regular rock. And then we have some fossilized teeth. And so these teeth come from an animal that's called an oreodont, um, which is no longer around today. They are all extinct. So they're all kind of random objects, right, that you might be able to find around a museum. But the thing that they all have in common is that they are able to glow. Um, so they glow through something called fluorescence. Um, you might have seen things like fireflies glow at night before. Um, that's using something called bioluminescence, where the animals are actually able to create their own light. Um, but fluorescence uses UV light. So you might have heard of UV light before. It's light that's just outside of what we're able to see. Yeah, somebody says black light. That's exactly right. It's the same thing. Um, so I'm going to switch back um, my camera. Now that I've moved my camera around, I can't, there we go. Okay, so I'm gonna move my camera right here. And so when we add the black light to these objects, you can see that they are starting to glow. Um, so they're glowing all sorts of crazy colors. Um, my favorite is the squirrel skeleton actually glows pink, which is really crazy. Um, it's uh, really, really pretty. Uh, now you can be heard in Mystique and perfect. Um, and so you can see the, uh, the coral here is glowing pink as well. Um, our rock that was just kind of a normal brown color is now this really bright orange. And then our oreodont teeth, which used to just be kind of brown as well, are now this really, really bright orange and yellow, um, which is really crazy. And so basically the way that fluorescence works is that these objects, these uh, either animals or rocks, have different materials in them, right? They're made up of all sorts of different stuff. Some of those materials are able to pick up all of the energy coming from the UV light, and then they're actually able to emit a little bit of it back out. Um, and what color light they emit depends on what the material is. So the squirrels have a really cool protein in their bones that makes them able to glow pink. Um, same thing with the corals, and then the oreodonts have materials in their teeth that make them able to grow, glow orange. Um, we're able to learn all sorts of different things from this and use this for all sorts of different stuff. So, for instance, um, there have been paleontologists that have used this glowing uh, material. Ooh, need to turn my camera around again, sorry. Um, that have used this, this glowing skill of these fossils to be able to search for teeny tiny fossils that they might otherwise miss. Um, people are able to study corals using this, study birds, um, and learn a lot more about kind of the hidden world of science that we weren't able to see initially. Um, yeah, so I apologize for the video issues that we had in the beginning of this. Um, hopefully, if you guys go back and you're able to watch the recorded session, then you'll be able to see um, the, the video from my view as well. 
Um, but of course, we're only halfway through the program. We also have our friends at the Embassy Bughouse that are going to show us some great, really cool critters. Um, so I'm actually going to turn off my camera and they're going to turn on their cameras over at the bug house and we should be able to see some really cool live insects. All Before right. We, that, we have a quick question. Yes, of course. Someone is wondering how do corals get protein? How do they get what? Protein. Protein. That's a great question. So everything that is alive for the most part, at least everything that um, has backbone, um, gets proteins uh, by making them. Um, and I guess that's true of almost anything that's alive. Um, but so pro uh, corals are actually a type of living animal. They might look like plants. We're backwards again. Animals. And so they're able to make their own proteins by eating stuff, basically, the same way that we are. Um, that's a really great question. You might think protein is like something that's just in meat. It's but protein is just in meat. It stays. If we shut it off, it goes the other way. Well, it looks like the bug house is ready to go. So I'm going to turn off my camera so you guys can see them. And I will mute myself. But bug house, you guys look great. Okay, hi, everybody. Welcome to the bug house. Can you hear me okay through my mask? Are you able to hear? Yes. Okay, great. Fantastic. So welcome to the bug house. My name is Amanda. I'm going to be one of your guides today. We also have Gary behind the camera who might help us with answering some questions. But we're going to start our spooky display by looking at the spiders. So spiders, a lot of folks think that these are spooky. This is our spider display that we have here in our main room of the bug house. And I just wanted to kind of highlight a couple of things about them. So even though a lot of folks think that spiders are very scary, they're actually really important for the environment. They are little predators going around and feeding on little pest insects. One spider that we wanted to highlight today is actually called the marbled orb weaver, but its other name is the Halloween spider. And you can see that this spider is orange in color. It also has little black patternings on it. And so a lot of people say that this spider looks like a jack-o'-lantern. I mean, more so when it's alive, of course. But we can tell that a spider is a spider by noting that it has eight legs, which they all do. They also have two body segments. And so if you see a little creature with two body segments and eight legs, then you know that that is a spider. We're going to move quickly down to another display. And this one is going to show us a lot of different kinds of general arthropods. And so we're going to look up here. So arthropods are creatures that have um, hardened exoskeletons. They have bodies that are divided into many segments. And they have jointed legs. And arthropods can be very spooky and very scary. But they are also very, very important in nature. And so we have things like centipedes and millipedes and scorpions and spiders, also the insects, also the crustaceans like crabs and crayfish and lobsters, those are all arthropods. All right, so moving right along, we'd like to show you some of our more Halloween specimens. And so we're gonna show you a white witch moth right now. So if we take a look here, this is called a white witch moth. They come from South America. It's actually one of the largest moths in the whole world, and their wingspan can get up to 14 inches across, which is very, very large. They're just a really, really cool, really large moth. All right, so we're going to show you a couple of other moths, kind of keeping with our Halloween theme here. So if we move across the bug house, we're going to come right into this corner. And we're going to look at what we call a death's head hawk moth. And so you can see this fellow right here. This is what we call a death's head hawk moth. If you look just below the head, you can see that it has kind of a skull-shaped patterning. So hopefully you can see that. This isn't the most awesome specimen of all the specimens that exist, but you can still see the skull pattern here. And the adults might recognize this as the insect from the cover of the movie Silence of the Lambs, if you've seen that. If we pan over, our last specimen in the displays that we're going to show you is this one right here. And this is called a black witch moth. So kind of like the white witch moth, but this one is, is much darker in color. They actually, when they're alive, have a little bit of a purple tinge to them, which is really cool. These moths are found in Mexico. They're found in Central America. They, they get up into Texas and Southern United States as well. And they're 
associated with a lot of folklore and legends. And so the, my favorite one that I found says that if you find a black witch moth resting above the door of your house, it means that you're gonna win the lottery. I thought that was really cool. All right, so now we are going to move into the live room and we're gonna take a look and meet some live insects and other arthropods. So if we come here through here, welcome to the live room at the bug house. And we're actually gonna start right over here with these little beetles. And so what these are, you can see these are blue, we call them death feigning beetles, which is really scary because it has the word death in the name. But what that means is that they actually will play dead or pretend to be dead when they are scared. And so if I grab one, and I, even if I very gently pick it up, usually it still kind of scares them. And you can see that he holds completely still and puts his little feet in the air and pretends to be dead. And now usually after a while, especially if I just kind of set this one down, he will turn back over and wake back up and continue along with his day. Sometimes it takes them a while though. They're very, very good at pretending. We can show you a couple, of mo couple more of them. So we grab this one. Is he also playing dead? Might be able to find one that wants to walk a little bit. Yeah, so these beetles come from the desert. You can find them in the southwest. Oh, that guy flipped over. They're scavengers. They actually cannot fly. And they can live up to eight years, so they live quite, quite a long time for an insect. All right. And I should say that we can take questions, and so if there are any questions and you want to post those in the chat or the Q&A, um, we can get those from our other host here. All right, so what we're gonna do is move to take a look at some cockroaches, which I think are very Halloween-ish and spooky. We walk across, you can kind of see we've got lots of other things in the big house. We're pretty excited today because we haven't been able to share these things with folks for a while due to the pandemic, and so it's really fun to have you guys in here and be able to show you what we have. So these are our hissing cockroaches. These guys come from Madagascar. So they're not the kind of pest cockroach, you know, that's all yucky and that you'd find in a building. These guys are actually tropical and they're very, very important in their native habitat as decomposers. And so if we take a look here, we can see there's both adults and juveniles. The adults actually got two males right here. And if we poke them very gently, we can probably get them to hiss. So let's listen very close. Can you hear that? This one's hissing really good. And so the way that they make that hissing sound, it actually, it doesn't come out of their mouth like it would if we made a hissing sound. It actually comes out of the sides of their abdomen here. So along either side, he's pushing air out to make that hissing sound. And now this is the only example of an insect that actually uses sound as a defense. Um, so it's really, really cool. These guys, for the most part, are very gentle. Whoops, this one's a little bit distressed, but usually they will just kind of sit in your hand and hang out for a little bit. I can show you one up close right here. Oops. And if you can see, and they actually have their heads underneath, which is quite cool, kind of protected like that. These guys are wingless, so they can't fly. And they're just very fun and cool to have around. A lot of I have a couple questions. Pets. Sure, go ahead. Okay, uh, so people are asking, how big do the cockroaches get? They can get um, maybe three inches long is, is probably what we, what we see them top out as. Actually, I can show you all of them here. We actually have a lot of them. This is a pretty big colony, but they are nocturnal, so they're usually kind of hiding during the day. You can see we have lots of adults and lots of juveniles. And if we go over to this side, we've got even more of them. And so you can see, they really like to live in groups. And the little ones are the babies. Yeah, the little ones are the babies. And then a couple more questions. Um, how many live insects do you have? And then how do the death-baining beetles stay completely still?
Oh, you're muted. Let's see. Okay, can you hear us? Yep. Okay, sorry about that. Um, so this question was, how many bugs do we have in the Dang bug it, house? I just lost the camera. Well, we probably have, let's see, we have, we probably have at least 20 different kinds of bugs. And I'm guessing that we would probably have maybe 100 individuals in the bug house. <clears throat> Did you get that? Yeah. Okay, and then the other question was, how do the beetles stay so still? Mm -hmm. I don't know. They just get really, really good at holding still. They can stay a lot stiller than I can. I don't know about you guys. Um, okay, are there any more questions about the cockroaches or the beetles? Just one for now. What is your favorite insect? It's not might not be the cockroaches or the beetles. <laughs> um, well, my favorite insect is actually something called a stag beetle, which is a biggish beetle and it has really big jaws. We actually don't have any of those alive here in the bug house right now, um, but, but that one is my favorite. And then I, I can't speak for Gary. All of them. I all like all them. insects. <laughs> he says all of them. All right, so let's take a look at BFG and then we'll check out our scorpion. So BFG, I'm actually not gonna pull her out and I'm not gonna open her cage because um, she's actually one of our largest, she is our largest specimen that we have. She's what we call a Goliath bird eater tarantula. And that doesn't really mean that she eats birds. It kind of just means that she's so big that people saw the spider and were like, oh my god, that thing must eat birds. And so um, they're not really known to like be jumping through trees grabbing birds, but they are certainly very, very large. Could easily take out like a rodent or something like that. These guys are native to South America. They are very harmless to humans, even though they look quite alarming. Um, but they're, they're mainly pretty docile and quiet. BFG likes to just sit, sit in her cage and kind of hang out. You can see she's taking a bath or a swim right now in her water dish. Um, she's probably actually drinking water right now is what she's doing. Um, but yeah, she is one of the largest tarantulas on earth. And at full size, these guys can get to about the size of a dinner plate which is pretty considerable. And her abdomen is, I would say her abdomen's about the size of a kiwi fruit, if you can visualize that. All right, we're gonna move right along, unless there are questions. There's just one about her, does she make webs? She does, but not a lot. Here, we'll, let's go back over. So can you see this kind of white stuff on the base of her cage here? A lot yeah. of tarantulas will make what we call a sheet web, which is kind of just laying a sheet of silk right underneath of them, almost like a picnic blanket. And then we think that that helps them sense as their prey are getting closer. So kind of like a regular spider would feel vibrations in their web. It's just that these guys are so big, they kind of have to sit on the ground. All right, great question. Thanks for all these questions, you guys. Dang it. I keep hitting that button. All right, sorry about that. Okay, so this is Rocky. Rocky is an African flat rock scorpion. And we wanted to show you Rocky for a couple of reasons. So first of all, Rocky's just a really, really cool scorpion to look at. Um, she's full grown, she's an adult. Um, but the secondly, scorpions will fluoresce. So just like Nick was talking about different kinds of like bones and rocks that are fluorescing. Actually scorpions do as well. So we're gonna show you or, or try to show you as, as well as it shows up. So right now we can see that the scorpion is a brown color, but if we shine a light, can you see how she kind of turns into this greenish kind of blue color? So she is fluorescing, which is really cool and so Scientists don't really know why scorpions do this. There's a lot of different hypotheses out there. One thought is that maybe it helps, e helps them to find each other at nighttime when they're kind of strolling around in the dark. 
The other thought is that it helps them to be able to sense sunlight very easily, even very small amounts of sunlight, and that helps them to know when to stay away, so just when darkness is coming on. Their eyesight is, is pretty poor. You can see, I don't know if you can see, but she has two little tiny, tiny little eyes kind of right in the middle here that are very hard to see. So her eyesight is not great. And so we think that that exoskeleton, this property, helps her sense when it's light and when it's dark. All right. Okay, we have a couple questions, sorry. Um, what do they eat? I think it's referring to the tarantula and the scorpion, and then we have a couple more questions about the scorpion. Um, so tarantulas and scorpions will pretty much eat any little bug that they're able to catch. And so in the bug house, we tend to feed them mostly crickets, because um, we can get those easily from the store and we know they're safe for them. Um, but in the wild, they would be catching just about anything that they could. That's a great question. Cool. And then how did Rocky get that name and is it a girl or a boy? So Rocky got her name um, because she's an African flat rock scorpion. And so in nature, these guys live tucked into little crevices and rocks. You can see how Rocky is super, super flat. And so it's just perfect for being able to kind of wedge herself in to little cracks and stones and rocks. So that's where the, the name Rocky comes from. Um, we're not 100% sure, but we do think Rocky is a girl uh, based on some of her characteristics. They have some structures on their underside that are supposed to be indicative of male or female, and she definitely looks more of a more female to me, at least. Good question. And then one last one for right now. Is she poisonous? Um, so she is venomous. So the difference between poisonous and venomous is Poisonous is when you eat something and it makes you sick, um, like a poisonous berry. Um, venomous is when something injects you with their venom. And so that's what scorpions do, that's what spiders do. They do have venom. It is um, powerful if you are a tiny bug. Um, with Rocky, we know that her venom is very mild, which means that if she was to sting me, I would be completely fine. It would be no worse than a bee sting. Now there are some scorpions out there that are very dangerous to humans. And so you don't just want to be going out picking up scorpions um, without knowing what the species is and what the potential danger is. But these ones that we have in the bug house are all very, very safe. Any other questions? I think that is it for now. Okay. I have one more creature that I'd like to show you, and this is a tarantula. So this is actually my favorite tarantula in the bug house, and her name is Goldie. Should I get her out? Okay. And Goldie is a Chaco Goldie tarantula. She actually comes from, I believe, Central America. And you can see that she's quite, quite big. You can also see she's very fuzzy, and you'll just have to take my word for it, but she's very, very soft. Like a kitty cat is soft, just, just very, very soft. Um, tarantulas actually use their hairs to sense. They also have very poor eyesight like scorpions do. We can see that Goldie here has eight legs, and she has two body segments, so we know she's a spider. She does have venom, but again, like the scorpion, it's very, very mild. And so even if Goldie was having a bad day and decided to bite me, it would be no big deal. One of the cool things about Goldie is she loves to spin webs. Different spiders have different personalities and Goldie just really likes to spin her webs. And so one thing we can often do with her is grab her by her spinnerets and then get some silk to come up. Oh, she's not doing it. Okay. I'm not sure we'll be able to see it anyway. Oh, oh. She is doing it. I don't know if you can see it. There's a little bit of silk coming out. Oh, yep, a little bit. Any questions about Goldie? Uh, how can you tell male and female? That's a good question. So you have to wait for them to be mature. When males are mature, they'll have hooks 
on their front palps, and the females do not. Also, we know that females live a lot longer than males do. Males usually live about 10 years. Females can live 20 to 30 years. Goldie is actually pretty close to 20 years old, which is pretty impressive. Cool, and then one more question about Goldie. Does she rub her abdomen? So tarantulas have specialized hairs on their abdomens that are called urticating hairs. And those are kind of itchy and irritating when they touch us or other animals. And so what she can do sometimes when she's really not in a good mood is take her back leg and kind of rub it along her abdomen. And he, in that way, she can flick those little hairs at anything that's threatening her. And so it's kind of like her extra little defense mechanism that she has. But Goldie really doesn't do that very much. That's one of the reasons why we like to handle her so much is that she's very, very gentle. Somebody just asked if she was really hyper, but it seems like she's not. She's pretty docile. <laughs> Any spider can get um, a little bit startled and move quickly if it needs to. But tarantulas are some of the more slow moving ones which again is, is why we like interacting with them. Oops, sorry, baby. You can see she's back in her cage. Okay, we're gonna show you a really pretty tarantula. You can see the bear. And this one, so this is Pele, and she is actually not one that we handle because she loves to rub her um, leg on her abdomen and flip those hairs. Can you guys see how she has a bald spot on her abdomen like that? That's from flicking all of those hairs off. But not to worry, because every so often she sheds her exoskeleton. And so pretty soon here, she's gonna get a whole fresh new kind of abdomen of hair. And we won't see that bald spot anymore. Got another tarantula here, this is arachne. She's a Mexican red knee tarantula. There are many, many different species of tarantulas. We think she's one of the prettiest. She's very Halloween looking too with her orange and black. All right, are there any other questions? Thank you guys so, so much for tuning in and being interested in the bug house here. We love showing off what we've got and showing our cool critters and sharing them with you. So we're super glad that you were here. We can answer any questions, if you have any other questions. There are a few more questions. Okay. Um, so how old were the last two uh, that we saw? Um, okay, so these ones, that's a great question. Actually, Gary, I think, would know better than me. They're probably around between 10 and 15 years old. We, we don't keep track of them completely, but I would say they're all pretty much close to 15 years old. We've had them here in the bug house for a long time. And um, some of them were kind of full grown even before we got them. So mm -hmm. um, we do our very best to keep, keep them going as long as we can. Some tarantulas have a shorter life. They may only live five or six years, but uh, most of the ones that we have are the longer lived ones. It's kind of related, but somebody asked, when a tarantula dies, do you replace it with the same type? Um, it just depends. If it's something that <laughs> is, is really unique and that people really like to see, um, then we might try to get another one of just that same type so folks can see. Um, but a lot of times we kind of just take in whatever um, we can come across that's appropriate. Um, we have to make sure that our animals, for the most part, are happy to be handled and, and held and interacted with. And so we do tend to look for things that are um, a little bit more, more docile and gentle. Cool. We have a lot of love for tarantulas uh, in the chat. And then one, two more questions. Um, <laughs> will she bite? I think this is, this is about one of the last two tarantulas. Um, none of our tarantulas are biters. Um, no, nobody's ever been bitten. Um, some of them do throw hairs, like Pele throws a lot of hairs. And so we, we usually don't handle Pele very much, but all of the other ones we will handle. Cool. And then, do you know you have cockroaches in your ears? 
<laughs> I do. Do you like my earrings? They're pink. Yeah. I thought they would be perfect for today. Yeah. So we have a happy Halloween from somebody. And then another question, uh, just when will you reopen? As soon as we can. We are yeah. <laughs> we're waiting on the university to make that decision, of course. Um, but in the meantime, we are working on videos and online programming. We're trying to kind of beef up our online offerings. And so if you have any suggestions for us, anything you would like to see, we would love to have those ideas emailed to us, or you'll actually be, I think, getting a survey after this. And so there might be a, a way to put that in the survey, but we're always happy to hear ideas. If there's something that you'd like to see, let us know. All right. I don't think we have any more questions, but we have lots of thank yous. So yes, thank you for this great presentation. Thank you, Paul. It was really, really fun. All right. We have Nick. Yeah, thank you everybody for tuning in today. Um, same thing, like, uh, like uh, the White House said, that we will be sending out a survey after this. Um, so just getting your feedback on this presentation, things we can do better, um, and just getting some general information about you all. But thank you so much for tuning in. It was really, really great to have everybody, and happy Halloween. All right. Bye.